Hey everyone, welcome to the Being Patient Podcast. I'm Deborah Kahn, founder of Being Patient. When my mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, I decided to use my skills as a journalist in a different way. Frustrated by the lack of information on science and the inability to get different expert opinions, I decided to quit my job at the Wall Street Journal to create a better platform for people impacted by dementia. We are a community where news and information is created by our team of journalists. We ask tough questions and we simplify the science so that anyone can understand. We don't only cover disease, but delve into the latest research on what it takes to keep our brains healthy. We invite the experts and ask your questions. Here's today's podcast. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Being Patient Brain Talks. I'm Mark New, a reporter at Being Patient. Today, we're going to talk with Dasha Kuiper, who is the Consulting Clinical Director of Support Groups at an Alzheimer's organization and has a master's in clinical psychology from Columbia University. She works with dementia patients and caregivers and has just written the book, Travelers to Unimaginable Lands, Stories of Dementia, the Caregiver and the Human Brain. Dasha, thank you much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I read your book, fascinating book. Um, it resonates with me very much. Uh, my own mother also has early stage Alzheimer's. So I, you know, when you open up this book, there's a little bit of nerves, like, should I delve into this or not? But once you get in there, you learn so much that you're you're glad you sort of took that step into finding more about um, something that we all don't know a lot about, but it makes you feel more comfortable. Oh, that's the nicest thing to hear. Thank you for saying that. So first of all, let's begin with you have experience being a caregiver yourself and working with caregivers of dementia and navigating the unimaginable territory, as you call it. Uh, Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, I I really wanted to um, have kind of, um, I was was studying... um, pathology and um, clinical psychology, but I was mostly doing research and I was so craving kind of a person interaction, um, which I wasn't getting any of. And I mentioned this to a friend and he said, oh, I have this man who has memory loss and uh, his son is desperately looking for someone. And I thought, okay, this might be good for a couple of months. And um, I went in there and I was so... um, I was so intent on really trying to understand everything that was happening to his brain, what his struggle was, and um, really eager to try to be as helpful um, to him as I could. And then these experiences, uh, you know, you know, accumulate uh, these various experiences that can be somewhat, you know, uh, traumatic experiences to, to even see and experience. Um why did you feel the need then to write this book? Yeah, um, you know, when I was um, taking care of this gentleman in the Bronx, I, with, um, you know, compulsively began to read all the literature there was. How do you communicate with somebody who has dementia, understanding what's happening to their brain? And as I poured through all the literature, the, um, you know, what I noticed is that I, it was, my brain was also becoming more and more affected. And I didn't see that reflected in the literature. And I began to feel really kind of ashamed of what was happening to me, because despite reading everything I could get my hands on, what I noticed is that no matter how much I read about this disease, that no matter how much I understood the symptoms intellectually and understood what was happening to his brain, I found that when he would get extremely angry with me when he would become accusatory, which is very typical with dementia. And I understood that I still felt it as so painful um, in part because I was really trying to do my best. And then I felt insane <laughs> for, for taking those symptoms personally, because I understood very well that there was nothing personal to it. I understood that that was Alzheimer's at work. And I began to see that his son in his own way was also behaving in ways um, that betrayed what I taught him about the disease as well. And I thought um, I really wanted to find 
more information about what was happening to the caregiver's brain because we're social animals. And um, I what I couldn't find is um, what I couldn't find as a reflection on the caregiver's experience, what's happening to their mind. Uh, I read a lot about that there's a lot of heartbreak. I read about the sadness, the financial cost, the psychological cost, but not um, but not what I was experiencing and what I would soon see when I would work with caregivers. I didn't see that reflected. Now you have that experience. We'll go more into some of those stories, which are fascinating, yeah. but you've got to deal with the science. So how do you approach finding the research on cognition and neuro neurology for the book? Yeah, well, um, at first, I think I began with a question, and that is, um, and this partly came also with my clinical experience in dealing with caregivers, uh, because after having my own personal experience and seeing the son kind of um, respond in ways that were irrational, um, I began to be really drawn to the caregiver's dilemma. And I think it began with a general clinical question that I kept observing, that no matter how well-intentioned, sophisticated, um, oftentimes kind, um, resourceful, reasonable, the caregiver was, what I found is that they kept on confessing to me that they still kept arguing <laughs> with their wife or their mother, that they kept on um, struggling to enter their reality. They said to me, you know, I read a lot about how I'm supposed to behave. And, and sometimes I manage to do it, but other times I don't. And a lot of the humor that came from my support groups were people confessing how um, crazy they were behaving at home. And I began to find it interesting. So I thought to myself, what is dementia doing to our brains that oftentimes we become more irrational than the person that we're taking care of? And so the question was, what are the needs of the ordinary healthy brain? And how is Alzheimer's undermining those needs? How is Alzheimer's making it very difficult, the disease, to adapt to this new reality? So many different stories and scenarios, uh, cases that you bring up, and all of them are a little bit different in, in, in the psychology of what each caregiver is going through. How did you choose these particular stories? Yeah. Um... You know, I, I spoke to so many caregivers. I wanted to make sure um, that the stories were varied enough that they would give access to different questions. Because in my chapters, every every chapter is broken down to different themes that I've seen caregivers struggle with. Why do we take um, why do we take symptoms so personally? Why do we argue? <laughs> why is it so hard to remember that it's their brain that's acting up? Why is it so hard? to stop blaming them, even though we know that the disease is culpable. So um, I tried to find those stories that, um, I tried to find those stories that reflected those big questions that I saw that were universal when I spoke to caregivers. And on a personal level, I just, I, I really adore the people I spoke to. So I really wanted to make sure that when I'm catching people behave at their most vulnerable and irrational, that these people were also very loving and kind and just struggling human beings that I, I hope what came across on the pages is that I truly, really enjoy talking to them and I really um, admired them as well. So that was very important to me that I'm not, it doesn't look like I am exposing these people, but really that these stories reflect a universal experience. I can tell you some of the, you know, cases that you brought up, um, were surprising to me. Um, the example of the couple, I believe that uh, they look like a normal couple. I think they're having an evening out. Mm -hmm. And every time they go home, or quite often when they go home, he completely forgets. And she has to keep trying to prove that she is, you know, his 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 wife. And yeah. that it's somewhat heartbreaking to talk about. And then she, you know, keeps trying to bring up, look, my clothes are there or whatever. And he says, you know, uh, something to the extent that how did you get here? You you sort of you planted this. Um, those stories might be even more common than we know. But are there any is there anything that surprised you in um, when you did your research for these various stories that, you know, really, you know, caught you caught you by surprise? 
I think that the more I began to research about the brain, and so what I did was I, I went a lot into social neuroscience, cognitive psychology, philosophy of mind. And the more I really began to understand the needs and biases and proclivities of the healthy mind, the more I, I assumed that this disease is agonizing. I didn't realize how cognitively draining this disease is, how um, stubborn our minds are about certain things that dementia requires that we give up. So for example, our, our minds have a very hard time giving up a mutual reality. Our minds really struggle um, to give up the idea that somebody else is responsible for their behavior. And there are evolutionarily good reasons why our brain does that. But it's, um, I think that it really floored me how uh, wonderfully, on the one hand, our brain is resilient, it's adaptive, but it is compulsively social. And when you're compulsively social, our brain has very rigid rules about how it expects other brains to behave. And that's when I began to go, aha, uh -huh. that's the reason it's so hard to accept this disease, even when intellectually, um, you know um, all about it. And um, our brain is just so committed to connections with other human beings. It began to really, um, I really began to understand why it's so hard for caregivers um, you know, to, um, to accept it. And it's not because caregivers are mean or, um, stubborn or rigid. It's because our brain has a needs too. And I think it's very easy to forget that because we're so consumed about the needs of the, you know, of the sick brain of the struggling brain of the brain that has the disorder. We assume that we can do anything. And that's just, I, I really found that that's just not the case something i struggle with um at an earlier even at an earlier stage of alzheimer's with my mom is this idea and i think it's also brought up in your book of do i need to try to prove to um, my mother that you indeed are forgetting things and you are sick you have you have this or is it better to just um help her out continue you know uh, getting these spam emails, keep having to point out, this is not real. This is real. See, I told you this yesterday. Yeah. Is there a point or is, is, is there an answer to this? Should I make it clear to them that they are not well or mm -hmm. whether to not disturb them and upset them and just accept yeah. it and continue on is i mean it may depend on various degrees of what stage people are at correct yeah i mean this is such a fraught ethical question too because at what point do you start lying to your mom and that's already a threshold i think people forget that it's very it's a very difficult thing it puts caregivers in a very in this moral dilemma when do i start lying to my mom when do i start going against her needs right let's say she says i don't want anybody in the house when do you feel like her the concerns for safety override what she wants. So I think people don't realize that on top of all the stress that you're dealing with your mom, you're also forced in these ethical conundrums. And it is always my bias, although I will say that this is just my view. There are different people in the field who have different perspectives. I think that at a certain point, for the sake of both the caregiver and the person dealing with dementia, that our objective should be um, shielding their self-image. Because I think that what I've noticed is that no matter how much the cognition declines, a person's self-image actually persists. And I think that we should be very keen on preserving it. So if we find that the person is just not accepting this disease, I think that for everybody's well-being, <laughs> that we um, that the ideal thing is to not confront them with this disease because I feel that they cannot handle it and it puts too much of a burden on both parties. Um, I say that I say that to you, but I but that's a very difficult thing to actually execute because your instincts are like, no, mom, we went through this. You have a problem. I'm here to help. Right. Because you want her to accept your help. <laughs> you want her to kind of um, you want her to um, understand where you're coming from. And all that requires is her understanding that she has a problem. Um, yeah. Yeah, I am. Um, I think I have one of those passages that relates exactly to that from your book. <laughs> <laughs> if I could read it, you could comment that because I thought it was really well written. Um, says on page 157. So when do we need to accept that a parent, spouse or friend is no longer morally accountable that someone is no longer a person to be trusted to choose 
uh, the, to choose the right thing. It's an ethical dilemma bound to haunt caregivers and explains why in many cases caregivers wait too long before taking away driving privileges or attaching a tracking device or bringing an aid into the house. Safety matters, of course, but so does a person's integrity, which is tied to a feeling of autonomy. But in dealing with the disease, there is rarely a clear divide between right and wrong. There are only trade-offs. Yeah. Exactly what we were talking about, right? Right. Yeah. And this is the reason I'm so loath to tell caregivers what to do, um, even though they oftentimes desperately want the answer. And I think it's the ambiguity in this disease that's so hard because I could tell you that, you know, who am I to say when it's right for you emotionally to start lying to your mom, right? Um, and the tricky thing is, is oftentimes your parents, they taught you right from wrong. They gave you these moral tenets to live by. And sometimes dealing with them effectively with dementia means betraying the very things they taught you when it comes to human decency. Um, and still, even when, and with parents also, they, they might they might be enfeebled in many ways, but they could be still very intimidating. They could still loom large, <laughs> no matter how uh, no matter how old you get. So to go against their wishes is really daunting. I think people don't realize how intimidating somebody can still be, no matter what stage they are in, in their dementia decline. What other things would you like caregivers to know? Um, boy, so many things. Um, I would. I wish that more than anything, once they read this book and they understand, but there's been so much attention paid to the brain of what the uh, of what the person living with dementia is going through. What I really hope that they get through in reading this book is the more they understand um, the human brain and how we've evolved to interact with other human beings that when they begin to see their own behavior that maybe you know when they're arguing or when they're behaving in ways that they probably shouldn't that they could give themselves a little bit of compassion and they could give themselves a little bit of forgiveness to say oh i'm reacting in a very human manner that most people are struggling to do this, that dealing with this disease is not just sad, it's not just financially costly, it's cognitively draining, and it's morally oftentimes impossible. <laughs> um, that there are no right ways to behave. As I said, there are trade-offs, you know, and and it's never going to feel good. You're never going to feel like you're doing the right thing. You're always going to be haunted by guilt because this disease is going to make you feel that no matter what you choose to do, it's never quite right or good enough. And that's the, and that's because of the disease. It's not because of anything that you're doing that's wrong. Okay. Um, we've actually got a question now. Um, I want a uh, question from Malia. Uh, in Travelers to Unimaginable Land, Dasha sheds light on how the problems, ways of interacting that characterize relationships between a husband and wife, mom and daughter, etc., before Alzheimer's affected one of them are magnified afterwards. I find lifelong um, personality struggles were also magnified between my sister and me as we tried to share care of our father after he got dementia. Oof, yeah. Oh, I hear you. This is such a major issue um, in support groups, too. And I mean, on top of all the hardships, there's also the strain on family dynamics. And what I find is that oftentimes the person who has dementia, not only are their personalities and challenging behavior is amplified, um, but also the family roles also become amplified. The person who is most likely to be the caregiver becomes even more consumed by this task. People have different positions on what should happen. And I think that it's very, very hard to navigate. It's very hard to navigate these family dynamics, um, especially when you're making these difficult decisions with others in mind. And the tricky thing is, is both parties could be completely right and they can both disagree strongly okay. with one another. I think we got some more questions coming up. Hang on a second. Anyway. Um, also, um, what, um, you know, after reading this book, you know, what do you hope readers actually learn, you know, about dementia and the brain? Um, I would like them to learn that people who have dementia, I think that maybe in the media, people who have dementia are oftentimes portrayed as very passive in the very, very late stages as completely helpless. What I want them to understand is that the reason you're being tortured by your family is because they're not that helpless. The brain is very complex. Yes, there's a disease that's uh, making it very hard for them to 
to do various things like follow instructions and maybe they can't remember but they're still but they're but they could still be emotionally and cognitively shockingly nuanced in certain ways and so um i think they're still capable of driving you crazy because they do have so many of their old abilities so many unconscious processes are not necessarily erased because of this disease so i so when people tell you oh that's just the disease it's not your mom i would like you to take them with a grain of salt because you know that there are many parts of your mom that are still there and they're still could be as loving and could be as exhausting and irritating and infuriating <laughs> as you've always known your mom to be and so i think that the people who have dementia are a lot more complex and a lot more capable than people give them credit for and the healthy brain um, can be as as helpless and as irrational and as um, volatile as the person who has the disease so this divide that we oftentimes think you're healthy so that means you're perfectly capable you're unhealthy that means you're completely health helpless I don't believe that is um I don't believe that is an accurate depiction of what happens and I don't and I believe that's an invalidating um, description of a caregiver's experience Right. I'm a writer too, and uh, sometimes we're taught to go toward the pain, but yeah. sometimes you really don't want to go there. Oh, I, yeah. I want to know about your writing process for this book and how you managed to, uh, you know, navigate and deal with such a, a, a heavy subject. Oh gosh, um, I um, my writing process is pretty torturous, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in part because I think that as I was writing this book, I was also listening to caregivers. And I think that because I was surrounded by their pain, I don't think it was their pain that made it difficult. It was the responsibility of reflecting that pain accurately that I think really weighed on me. Um, I felt such admiration and awe when caregivers were able to express to me the reality of their experience. So I think I felt a, a tremendous responsibility to, to accurately portray that. And so I think that that was the real that was the real kind of writing difficulty. And of course, to to kind of do a mixture of stories and science, so one would not overtake the other. Okay. Now let's talk about you, though. Um, what's up next for you? Um, uh, any readings for the book, or are things events coming up? Yes, I am um, going to be doing various talks I have at universities. I will be um, traveling to different places to talk. I'm actually working um, in a new place um, called Renewal Care, and I am the clinical trainer. So what that means is I speak to mental health professional caregivers, professional caregivers about some of the themes of my book and um, to try to educate them a little bit about the the struggles and the difficulties um, that our brain has when it comes to adapting to and accommodating this disease um, in hopes that people feel less alone and have a greater neurological framework of why they're struggling. Future books in the work? Oh, God. <laughs> that question put so much terror into my heart. Um, I think that um, I need to pause and listen and uh, learn more about my experience because it's really the clients that really informed this book. So I want the experience to lead the writing. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dasha, for joining us. It was really a pleasure to have you and, and to meet okay. you. And thank also you. thanks to our audience for tuning in. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter on beingpatient.com, where we'll keep you up to date on all the upcoming talks. See you next thank time. You so much. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. For more information on upcoming interviews, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at beingpatient.com. That's B-E-I-N-G-P-A-T-I-E-N-T.com. And send us any feedback you may have, whether it's someone you want us to interview or any comment about our podcast series. You can do so by emailing info at beingpatient.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'm Deborah Kahn.